Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, CDO Vision. This series is designed to give you a round of education on data strategy topics in addition to our annual face-to-face -face CDO Vision event. We're already well underway for planning next year's event to be held in Atlanta, Georgia. In fact, uh, we've got a call for presentations out right now, if anyone, and that's extended through tomorrow. Uh, this month in the webinar series, John Lally and Kelly O'Neill will discuss data governance and EIM, take the scary stuff out of your programs. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDO Vision. As always, we'll send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst Joan Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the President and Chief Delivery Officer at First San Francisco Partners. And joining us is, as well as Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the Founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and system providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management. Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on intricacies of implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Uh, hello and welcome. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Shannon. And uh, John here and Kelly over there. Uh, and we're going to have a little fun today with some serious topics because sometimes you have to have fun um, with, the, with this stuff. Uh, so we're going to kind of follow the October theme here. And while we're here, uh, and, and the reason, well, while, not while we're here, but why are we here, um, and we're going to talk about some of those things that, that, that motivate people to do uh, things that aren't quite uh, beneficial to uh, EIM uh, uh, programs, data governance programs, analytics, MDM, data quality, whatever, all of those. Um, uh, we, we all probably, all of us listening probably have some sense of where things, messages can't get across uh, and why, why there's hesitancy, why there's delays, and there's a lot of time. And Kelly, you can echo the, a lot of our questions after a session at a conference are based on how do I get someone to listen? They won't do this, they won't do that. Um, and, and we're going to kind of dive into that in a lighthearted way today, but hopefully with some good serious advice uh, for those of you that are uh, brave enough to stay with us during this almost terrifying uh, webinar um, and learn some coping skills. Um, uh, and most of this is, 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 is induced by fear. Two basic human emotions if you talk to uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, and that is, is, is love and fear. And uh, fear does motivate us, even though we don't quite know it is fear. And we're going we're gonna to use that theme here uh, today. And uh, Kelly and I are going to go back and forth and tag team on things. Uh, we have a list of scary things, um, and it's not the spiders and the pumpkins and the hands and all of that, but it's just some topics. I'm not going to read them all. They're there for you to look at when you downloads or whatever, but it goes across a bunch of scenarios, a bunch of things people say, and we're going to look at what those fears that come in that topic are, and then we're going to look at what some of the responses you could have. Along the way, we're going to see a lot of Halloween scary things, and for absolutely no prize whatsoever, other than our acknowledging you during the Q&A session, if you can guess the media or uh, a source of the picture uh, we're putting up there, then uh, you might uh, be able to embrace uh, 2.4 seconds of fame here on this uh, webinar. So pay close attention and have your fingers ready to ask us questions and, uh, and submit some things. So the first one here is failure is not an option. In fact, for most of us, we have to acknowledge 
it is inevitable. Kelly, these things don't go perfectly smooth right off the gate, do they? Definitely not. And I think that this idea of being prepared to fail and it be okay is, it, like you said, it's inevitable and should be planned for. That's right. So um, when the uh, poor uh, soul here in the picture uh, did pick out the, uh, the brain from a Mr. A, B, and normal, um, uh, there was certain some chastising going on, but he didn't get fired because as far as I would know, he was in the rest of the movie. Um, um, some things you might hear on this is uh, I need to focus on my area. This is distracting. I don't, I don't have time. Uh, it's never worked before. Um, uh, one thing I heard very recently, which I really enjoyed, was our data is like the weather around here. We get the first number and we ignore it because we know it's going to change tomorrow. Um, uh, and and you know that's those are those are um, signs of uh, people not being particularly enthused or engaged. But uh, to Kelly's point is there should be no penalties. Uh, tell people either the people you're working with, your stakeholders, uh, employees, uh, whatever you're using predictive models, you're using analytics. You know what? The first ones are going to require adjusting. You're using a data quality program. Those first profiles are going to show ugly stuff, and you might realize that you might realize that the profiles are maybe overstating data quality problems or something like that. Uh, you have to be aware or ask for a little bit of leeway when these first two things happen. So, um, for example, if you're rolling out a policy and the policy doesn't quite sit well with the organization, then nobody should feel like they're going to get fired over that. I just make, make some adjustments. Um, if you're going to do data standards and they're a bit too harsh, uh, which they tend to be initially, um, they, they uh, um, you know, you should have the leeway to adjust those. You don't want people to say that, 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 that it's not going to work, it's going to fail, so we're just not going to engage, we're not going to participate. Anything to add to that one, Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is one of the topics that we've touched on in a variety of different ways throughout the year. And the idea is that uh, with uh, a new initiative, comes change. With change comes trying and sometimes failing. And this thought process of uh, an initial launch that is really enthusiastic, lots of dedication, lots of resources, executive sponsorship, et cetera, and then as the work starts to happen, things might fail and things might go wrong. And so then as people start to get discouraged, they fall into what we call the trough of disillusionment. And that trough of disillusionment many times is where programs get abandoned, as opposed to understanding that that trough inevitably, inevitably occurs in any sort of change cycle. And the idea is to pick up on those learnings from the failures to move out of the trough of disillusionment so that you ultimately come out on the other side with a stronger program, stronger success, um, better understanding of your data, et cetera. So this is, yeah. this is, I'm glad that this is the first one because to me that's a really good uh, and important thing is, is understanding that, that failure will occur and it's actually a learn, an opportunity to learn in a positive thing. Absolutely. And, and by the way, the uh, winner of absolutely nothing for the first panel was Todd, who uh, successfully identified this as a scene from Young Frankenstein or Frankenstein, if because uh, that's how it's really pronounced. Um, uh, um, the answer has already come in from the second slide. Oh my gosh! Um, now we know how to get him to pay attention, Kelly. Okay, award uh, uh, award here. All right, the fear here, crazy scenarios. There's this fear where we hear, uh, and boy, we see this a lot. Um, things headed in different directions. John, um, did we miss one? Uh, I thought I think we missed did we one. Miss Can one? we go back one? Yeah. Did we miss one? Oh, there oh, we are. We this is another one, one of I my favorites. <laughs> there is a there is a ghost. There is a ghost here in my presentation because it skipped a slide. We have a we have a poltergeist. Um, okay. Um, uh, consequences of mistakes. So not only do you have people thinking you're going to fail, and you have to allow for that. It's your own personal fears. You've never done this before. Uh, we're drinking out of a fire hose with this effort. There's too many moving parts. Um, uh, we, we, uh, we have this roadmap from this consultancy that brought us this with 10 million things to do. We can never get caught up uh, in, in all of that. 
Um, uh, here's some things we, we tell folks. Um, uh, uh, neither has a lot of other people. You're not alone uh, with this. Uh, these things can be overwhelming. Uh, data governance especially, there is a tendency for folks to realize this was a lot more work than I thought it was going to be. And that is a great maturing moment right there. Um, the other thing, a lot of people forget this, uh, Kelly, I don't know why, but it took over 30 years plus for some of these systems to get to this point with data, and you're not going to fix it in one or two. Um, we've seen some CDOs in the last few years uh, move on from their jobs because they didn't work miracles in the 18 months they were given to work miracles, and that's uh, frankly unfair to the chief data officer. Um, and then lastly, uh, prioritization is a core business function. You're supposed to prioritize things. Do what helps the business earlier. So, you know, uh, the sli you slice this thing off. We're going to talk more about slices in a little bit, but, but uh, do what's important uh, first. Right, Kelly? Absolutely. I think everyone prioritizes in their job. I haven't talked to anybody who's not feeling like they're overworked or too busy. That's the nature of the world we live in now. So regardless of whether it's EIM or any other aspect of the business, prioritization is um, uh, a requirement. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the uh, winner of absolutely nothing on this slide is Wayne who has, once again, young Frankenstein and Gene Wilder, uh, the late, great Gene Wilder, as yeah. featured on here. And at, he's saying, at this point in time, it's alive, right? So now let's go to this other slide, uh, which someone has already got uh, the correct answer for. Um, uh, um, who doesn't have, Kelly, who doesn't have a whole bunch of stuff going on that seem to be disparate uh, areas in the EIM world, but nobody's talking to each other, right? That's right. Yeah, um, uh, so you, this is manifested by, you know, there's the MDM program over there, and, uh, and then the analytics program, and you've got uh, consulting firm X and IT working here, and consulting firm Y and the business area working over here, and they've never talked to each other. Um, you've got IT doing something for a business unit and the business isn't paying attention because they don't want to talk to IT they, they, because they don't like them. Um, or you have the, uh, um, uh, the executive vice president getting everything they want, the squeaky wheel has been greased, and they have the, uh, their consultants in there and it's uh, the darling effort and there's been no balance or business alignment done, but it's out there banging away anyway. And the scary part is, and because we're talking about scary things today, is all three of these can be happening at the same time, right? That's the real scary part. Uh, Kelly, I'm up to about, maybe I can count maybe on two hands, but I'm somewhere between five and ten big organizations in the last four years I've talked to that are doing exactly this, three things headed in different directions, and it's all the same, same discipline. And I think the irony is that many times they know that they're headed in different directions and it's difficult to break down those walls in between groups that have accountability for a program and what is an enterprise accountability and if someone's given the requirement to execute a program many times especially in the form of master data management people associate it really tightly with a project then they go off because they've got a time commitment, a budget commitment, et cetera, and their incentive, their incentive and potentially a bonus is based on the successful delivery as opposed to an integrated delivery approach based on the fact that the data is being used also in the analytics program, also in the data governance and data quality program. So I think that organizations actually set up these silos and these walls uh, sometimes purposefully. Which is scary. Oh, uh, it's scary, <laughs> and we're talking about scary things. Um, what I, the other scary thing is I've had conversations and interviews with EVPs or VPs, and I've said, yes, I know this is going over there, but what can I do about it? I've told them we really should do something more integrated, and they go, no, you know, or they did and some of the other excuses we're going to see here in a little while. Um, that's where we come up with our remedy, which is, and this is a real simple one-step one. We've talked about this during the year is technical debt and data debt. Um, 
we, we don't need to go into it now and, you know, listen to our metrics presentation we did a few months ago or, 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 or just send us an email, whatever. Um, you can measure the amount of technical and data debt you are accruing by doing this. Right. It is, it is not that hard to measure it nowadays. And you, if you show that number to somebody and they do ignore it, then the onus is on them because uh, you've showed them a, a pretty scary, scary number. And we're talking about scary stuff today. Um, the winner is Maxine on that slide who nailed this one within a nanosecond of the slide coming up. So there we go. That's uh, pretty good. Um, and of course, that's Macaulay, call, Macaulay, where the heck is he now, Culkin, uh, as the actor in that and that role. Um, moving on, let's see if I can, the, the ghost doesn't get us, and we can go from six to seven. Yes, we can. There we go. Uh, again, different directions. Um, uh, um, you, you want to go an easier way, but you're going to create long-term havoc, but something is politically expedient to do it that way. So we will get, again, we're going to record, we're going to coordinate different data governance efforts, um, uh, or our MDM project is dependent on data governance, and we're going to do the data governance so it'll be standalone. Um, or if someone says, you know, why well, rent to a conference and data lakes are great because the data volumes remove the need for data quality or data governance, in which meant they were just listening to someone selling a product. And, 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 um, uh, uh, and so they make a pronouncement and go down the wrong direction uh, at, at, at will. So this is similar to the prior slide, but they're mentioning all three together. And again, it's the same solution, add up the technical debt. Um, anything to add to that, Kelly? This uh, kind of a similar thing, the last one, but some other examples. Um. Yeah. I just think this this idea and whether uh, it is owned by governance or maybe it's owned by the EIM program, but the idea of adding up the technical debt and the data debt, I think is going to, to flow throughout all of these scary statements. And um, nobody, you know, in the organization has that, that on their title, but it might be something to consider as owners of these programs to keep your own little cheat sheet of what you think the implications oh, yeah. going to be of some of these decisions, because it, it really can add up quite significantly over time and uh, without recognition. So Absolutely. it's a great concept. Absolutely. And the, the other remedy, because everyone's wondering, gee, where's our scary picture? The other piece of advice is don't hide behind the chainsaws. Now let's see how fast it takes for someone to get this one right while I move ahead. Um, <clears throat> Um, this was one of my favorite things I saw on television last year. Um, and we got an answer and it is incorrect. Um, so we're going to let that one percolate a while. Everyone take a good look at that picture and we will move on. But one last piece of advice, when there's lots of nasty things going on, don't hide behind the chainsaws. See, that's important. That's valuable advice today, right, Kelly? I mean, where else are you going to hear that? to not be hide behind the chainsaws in a data management forum here. <laughs> right. um, okay, uh, uh, us versus them. And, and when I was looking, you know, for the pictures here, uh, I wanted to get, you know, what is weird? And nothing defines weirds more, there we go, uh, the Adams family. And that's uh, Gail and Sue got those literally simultaneously here. Um, and someone, Maxine just got the last one. It is from a Geico commercial that aired uh, last year. IT has a poor reputation, data management has a poor reputation, uh, or worse, other strategic bidding users can do that, but they're weird and I don't want to do what they're doing. Um, so you're like that weird neighbor of the Adams family and, and, and you can either afraid to go outside or afraid to be seen in public. Um, the remedies here are call a truce, all right? First of all, IT is not out there deliberately to mess with business people, and nor is the opposite true. Things have evolved to get where they are. At some point, you have to say, look, let's move forward together. Everyone needs to do some sort of data management in this world. There is no such thing as doing business without data management now. There's no such thing as being a regulated business without having data governance now. Uh, you know, embrace that. Just, it's no longer an option. Someone has to deal with that, you know, and like, you know, the, the Adams family had some neighbors that didn't like them. You know what? They moved in, they bought the house, yeah, they decorated it kind of weird, but you know what? You're stuck with it. You've got to move on. 
you've got to uh, to live with it, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And the blending across all of these different organizational boundaries, it's no longer an us versus them in any stretch. Um, and that's, I think people are starting to see that. I think that's the good news. That is the good news, that is the good news. And uh, several people, again, like I said, Sue and Gail simultaneously, uh, I guess the uh, Adams family there, of course, that's the TV version that was uh, on when I was a little shaver. Um, and uh, um, everyone who watched it growing up is now has that stupid theme song in and stuck in their head and they're snapping their fingers as we speak. Um, unfortunately, I can't do the music through this uh, facility or we would be, we would be singing it together. Um, uh, we're gonna move our picture ahead a little bit here, uh, the cartoons of the uh, 80s. Um, and we're talking about fear, row. row. Um, uh, it's too severe, you know, we, we just can't take this risk. You know, we can't mitigate the risk, it's, it's, it's too scary. Um, well, you know, data governance does equal change. Um, so does predictive analytics, so is MDM, so is all of this. Um, um, uh, we also hear it's too busy to get it. We don't have time to absorb it, uh, things like that. A um, uh, couple of ways to get around this one, um, and I know you've got uh, uh, thoughts on this one, Kelly, because we've had some interesting uh, clients in the last two or three years of various uh, degrees of resistance that have been um, uh, exhibited. Um, get the perception of, of, of change and impact independently assessed, okay? When someone come in, and there's lots of firms that do change impact analysis, will say, this isn't a big deal, this is a sea change, but this is how you need to deal with it. Um, urging folks to think, this is a long-term proposition. Um, how often do you hear people complain that we're always thinking tactically, we're always thinking tactically, always low-hanging fruit? All right, well, guess what? This stuff is long-term. You finally got what you asked for. Remember, you know, grandma said, don't, you know, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. A lot of, of folks we work with are actually getting the onus of starting up a long-term sea change of the business program. And it's kind of scary, never did it before. Um, there are remedies, like just do core data elements first, do core metrics first, uh, go a domain at a time. We've talked about all these rollout options before. There's all kind of ways to lessen the impact and not make it severe. But, um, uh, uh, um, there, you know, again, it's a source of fear, but uh, there are ways around it. Uh, the, the fact that the fears themselves, those statements are unfounded in fact. Uh, it does equal a change, but you know, nothing worth doing right is going to be no change, right? Anything to add to that, Kelly, before we move on? Well, I think in our day and age, the impact of doing nothing is more severe than the impact of getting started. And so oh, yeah. if you're thinking about the assessing an impact, that would be a perspective that I think would be extraordinarily meaningful. And um, John, like you said, the, it doesn't need to be big bang. It doesn't need to be a big program. The idea is that you start by doing something that's small, meaningful, and impactful and grow from there. So I think sometimes, and you know, I feel like sometimes we're guilty of, of uh, creating this impression at the conferences and all of that, that it is, you know, that there's a lot to it, it's a big program, you know, we've got all these frameworks, right, that, that are so comprehensive, et cetera, but the implementation can be bit by bit, and over time, it grows, it's, you know, it's planting one flower in the field, and after a while, you've got a, a field of a thousand different flowers. So that is the way of making the impact, as opposed to waiting and seeing what the impact is if you do nothing. Yep, yep. Uh, one other uh, bit of a remedy before we move on here, don't, don't, don't forget the Scooby Snacks, right? Um, and this one was really easy, got a lot of correct answers. This was like, so we're gonna make this one a little bit harder. Name the character on the far left of the picture, all right? Um, and also name the personality or actor who provided the voice of that character, and we'll see how what kind of um, uh, trivia knowledge we have out there in the area of cartoons. There's so, some okay, rapid Googling here. happening right now. Bang, <laughs> yes, there's people that, 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 yeah. So it's, there we go. Um, we had three people, Noel and Todd 
and Gideon, all guess that that's Shaggy is the character, and Casey Kasem, the great disc jockey in the American Top 40, was the voice of Shaggy. Oh, very, very good. Oh, another problem. Uh, this is such a smart group here. Um, well, they're already snapping in names to the next one, and I haven't even answered answered the uh, the, uh, the the question. Um, um, uh, but you're, I got a twist for you folks that are typing furiously away right now. Just wait till the end of this slide. <laughs> All right, another monolithic strategy. Uh, boy, have we heard that. Oh, this is just like dot, dot, dot. Insert your expired program here, right? Um, or there's something else that we see here when people say we're not going to do a big bang. We're, we're not going to, we're not going to get into that. We're going to be incremental. Because um, we're not going to do it like that other thing we did that was that was a big bang, uh, and then we start to look at roadmaps and how things are rolling out and do assessment of current programs. And what we find inevitably is, without conscious effort, people are sneaking towards a big bang. Uh, we just recently, uh, uh, I'm not where I'm sitting now, but with another client recently, looked at everything. I said, "Do you realize you've crafted a big bang here for yourselves?" Oh no, it's incremental. We incremental are doing four different work tracks and they all get implemented on the same day. Mm, no, that's a big bang, okay? Um, and a lot of people will think it has to be centralized and, and people don't consider even it, with all the literature that's out there, that federation is really, really uh, important. Um, so uh, the remedy here, you know what? We've learned a lot in the last five to 10 years about these types of projects. These things are becoming more and more successful uh, yeah, you're going to see uh, stuff from us coming up next year that we're getting ready for of uh, success stories and the, the ads, the more and more analytic success stories and governance success stories, they are adding up like crazy right now. So no, folks, this stuff can work and, and you need to, to convey that to people. Uh, you need to create value though. You need to show value. It's not just putting in the tool. Putting in the tool and getting the tool lit up is not success. You need to show business value. Um, and the last thing is a lot of us have strategies out there and they go, why don't we implement our roadmap that the consulting firm did with us? Well, because you don't know how to execute and no one bothered to learn how to execute on a roadmap. Um, and it's a useless vehicle unless someone has told you how to take action on it. So that is the other remedy. Um, before I wrap up here, uh, Kelly, anything to add on, on that? Yeah, I think just a couple of things. I think one is we've learned a ton as an industry. I think the other thing is if you hear a comparison, it's just like, you know, this other failed program, that's an, a learning opportunity as well. Why did it fail? What were the challenges? How can we prevent it from happening again? Um, what can we learn from it? Again, failure is going to occur. So how can we learn from that failure rather than repeating it? So I think that that's one thing. And I think the other thing is, in terms of tying it to a strategy, it can't be an isolated strategy. It needs to be tied back to the core strategy of the business. So if there's not a clear link between the, strat the data strategy or the information strategy and the business strategy, then people will start to lose interest over time. They won't have the stamina to make it through the trough of disillusionment. Um, and they won't necessarily see that the resources that are being requested are um, meaningful and will have an impact on the way that they're taking their, their business anyway. So, um, for example, uh, moving from a B2B business to a B2C business. A lot of companies that have traditionally sold through distributorships are trying to create a relationship with the customer directly. It's happening in every industry. We've got a client who's looking at that right now, and um, that is a corporate strategy, and that has a huge information and data impact. Therefore, everything that should be done should tie back to the execution of that corporate strategy. And thus, your information strategy is your corporate strategy and vice versa. Oh, uh, you know, I guess that's another remedy here, that if you are in a program that's languishing now as governance or analytics or, or whatever, and you, you can't get the engagement and all that, and you have a nice roadmap, you, you know, try to say, we are doing these, we're trying to do these types of data governance activities or MDM activities or data quality, whatever, and what business strategy, what bottom line, balance sheet, income statement result might we be helping with our activity? 
If you can't answer that, you haven't done alignment as alignment should be viewed. If um, uh, we, we uh, just recently looked at another roadmap done by uh, a different firm, uh, and we were just asked to do a, a, a review. Um, and it was a fine, fine document. It was hefty and had lots of great pictures in it and roadmaps. It was very detailed and it was actually pretty good quality work, except it was missing one thing. And that was all this activity that's being done, what's it for? And I said, just ask whoever did this for you, what is the intent behind it? And they went, well, you're going to use this and do your business things. Well, why isn't that in there? Why don't you have content to, to show that? The people. I said, well, you know, the organization is based on these two principles. We're, we're wonderful with our customer and we're super efficient, most competitive price type stuff. And we go, oh, that's awesome. But, but, but if you are that, what, what do you want to, what's that look like next year? What does being customer intimate look like next year? What's the goal? What's the target that you're trying to hit? No one had tied that together. So they had a pretty decent strategy. They had a pretty decent roadmap. No way that's going to stick. No way that's going to stick. Um, you know, you've got to be careful who you ask for help from. Now, this particular character on this slide, it's everyone we've had, let's see, we have uh, Maxine, Micheline, and Wayne have correctly identified Michael Keaton and the movie Beetlejuice, but here is our little twist, you know, don't say Beetlejuice three times or you are on your own, right, if you remember the movie, but notice how I spelled that. Um, this is pronounced Beetlejuice by those that are in the hobby, but it also represents something else. What does that represent? And we'll see if anyone is, uh, and then what is the correct pronunciation uh, for sure? Oh, there we go. Todd is, he's on fire. So is Jill. That is, a, I'm waiting for the pronunciation. We'll keep going here and uh, see if anyone can phonetically spell it and go from there. Um, We're going to have to wait, open it up for Q&A because everybody else is on mute. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought about asking to unmute everybody today, but I, uh, that would have been um, a bit chaotic. This next one is kind of, a, a, it's scary because people act like this. I, I don't, I'm, we're, we're having fun today, but this is kind of scary. All right, we got... Uh, um, uh, um, we got we got the answer correct. The last one, the 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 word I put up there is a star. Uh, it's a it's a it's a binary star system, uh, which we call Betelgeuse in the astronomy hobby world. But the correct pronunciation is Betelgeuse. Um, but um, when I you know hear Betelgeuse, you think of the if you're in a star, if you're if you have a telescope, you think of uh, uh, the the star formation. All right. So this thing here, hiding the truth versus being honest. Has anyone out there in uh, a listener land, uh, done a data quality uh, work um, or, or looked at some accuracy of some data and said, boy, this is really awful, and then heard, well, we can't tell anyone it's that awful. We'll get blamed for doing it. Um, that's not really the honest approach, right? Um, so people polish the results or someone's resistant. Uh, we're supposed to, you know, we quit using that access database. We now have a really, really good uh, source of analytics here. We don't need to do access anymore. And, that person says, well, I really like this, I'm comfortable with it. It more or less is what you've got, so I really am just going to go ahead and use it. And someone says, well, leave that person alone because he's worked here for 30 years or something. Um, uh, uh, that's not honest. That's not honoring the work that's been done. Um, people say, do change management later. Don't, don't honor the organization impact. Uh, that's a real common tactic, and that's not an honest approach either. You're saying that people won't be affected or they will just romp into the new world without any help. Um, uh, you know, essentially, any time you hide the truth or hide the difficulty or anything, you're doing your organization a disservice. So, so what's happened? The fear here, because, again, we're talking about scary stuff. The fear here is that you're going to say something and get blamed or get in trouble or get censured in some way, and that's not a healthy environment. Um, uh, to get away from that, um, communicate until they're sick of hearing about it. I tell this to people all the time. Kelly tells this to people all of the time. We look at communication plans we do for people and they're not executing them. You must do all of those communication events and you do them over and over. And I had one vice president tell me, we communicated until they threw up. Now that's a bit colorful, 
uh, uh, maybe an exaggeration, but that surely gets that that surely gets the point across that that is how much they had to communicate, and then the light bulb went on. It's not easy. It requires some conscious effort, but the payoffs are huge by being honest, uh, admitting to the amount of work that has to be done. So then you can do it incrementally, and then and then and then uh, um, uh, communicate about it. What's different? What's new? How are we doing this? Over communicate. Over communicate. Over uh, communicate. Um, uh, uh, so there we go. Now, Kelly, want to weigh in on that one a little bit here? We just have a few slides left, actually, so we got plenty of time for Q and A here today. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a couple of things. Um, this this slide to me is really what calls out a lot of organizational fear, and it's fear of exposing the fact that people spend a lot of time fixing the data and remediating the data and weekends and nights and they don't want to admit to their management that they are spending all of this time because management doesn't know and if they found out they would be appalled um, we've gone into many organizations where if you ask a an evp or a senior person um, tell us how data quality um, negatively impacts your business. They'll say, well, we have no data quality problems. Our data quality is fine. And the more you drill into that and the more you speak with the people who actually work with the data, we ask the same question, tell me how data quality negatively impacts your business. And the people who work with the data start to fidget and look sideways and look up and see if their, their neighbor's going to speak first, et cetera, et cetera. And I think the reality is, is nobody wants to admit how much time is spent fixing data because management thinks that they thinks that the data is fine. I can't remember which of the webinars that we talked about on the talked um, spoke about this topic, but they think you're already doing it. They think that the data is fine already. They think that it's governed. Mm -hmm. They think it's it's high quality. And the fear is people admitting that in fact we aren't there yet and there's some very viable reasons that we aren't there yet. Um, so that's that's one thing I wanted to add is, is that this fear factor um, is, is real. And for those senior people that are listening in on the webinar, it's pervasive across all industries. So it's important oh, yeah. to recognize that you need to let your people admit that there's, fee that there's um, uh, poor data quality issues and give them the space to fix it and the the opportunity to fix it. So that's uh, one of my rants on this slide. And I have another rant. Do I have an, do I have time for another rant? You yeah, you got a minute for okay. another rant. <laughs> okay, so I'm going I'm going through the watching people respond on the chat and everything and, and Jill Wanless um, says, I communicate so much I'm sick of hearing me or I'm sick of hearing myself. And I think a lot of you on the on the line can probably appreciate what Jill is saying. Um, and I heard from someone that you have to say something twenty eight times for people to remember it. And sometimes I feel like because people's work uh, lives and personal lives for that matter are so busy and so dense and uh, they're doing so many things that it's that it's probably more than 28 times and so it's important to communicate not just repetitively but in a variety of different ways so that they can see things visually they can hear things they can talk to their friends about it they can engage and there's this this uh, way to um, uh, get a point across without having to repeat the same words, but you're repeating the same concepts and continuing to communicate so that people do truly buy into and can repeat back and internalize the content and the information that they're receiving. Absolutely. Um, uh, got a lot of correct answers to this one right away, uh, Young Frankenstein, so I'm gonna just up this a notch here. Um, uh, this is a scene where uh, uh, the uh, actor playing young Frankenstein, I would like that actor's name. I would also like the other actor in this scene who is a very well-known actor that begged Mel Brooks to have a part in this movie and got it. And I would like to know the name of that actor who was also in the scene who actually lit um, uh, the man's uh, thumb on fire. So, you know, some things are obvious. Be honest. Dude, your thumb's on fire. All right, just point it out. 
no one's going to be uh, upset. Um, oh, there we go. We got uh, um, Peter Boyle uh, there and Gene Hackman. Very, very good. This is a sharp group here. All right, losing the big picture. Um, this is a, 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 we hear this manifested, um, uh, and we already got the character, uh, but okay, what's this, what's the show? What's, what's the, uh, the, the, uh, the TV show this is from too? And um, we already got the, uh, um, and the Adams family's already come in, boy, they're quick. So um, we hear low hanging fruit, a proof of concept of data governance, really? Um, uh, um, uh, things like uh, like that, uh, losing sight of the big picture, wanting to do little bits because the monger, and the fear here is that when, when someone in management says, I want a proof of concept, I want low hanging fruit first, what, they, what they're really saying, and this is the absolute truth, is they don't understand your target vision. And, and actually, this is good feedback for you to actually go back and communicate some more because the light bulb hasn't gone on. So they want to see a proof of concept. I mean, they don't know what your vision is. Um, and, you know, and don't take that personally. Whatever method you used to present the vision, you didn't accomplish your mission. Go back and try it uh, again. Um, uh, uh, the other thing is there's a real difference between doing something that's tactical because it can be non-aligned and non-strategic. And remember what Kelly said about alignment. That is so, so really, really important. And if you do something one-off, just to keep someone's attention, great. You've got their attention, but inevitably, subconsciously or consciously, they remember that what you did is not tied to that business strategy, and it really didn't move the organization farther down the road towards that strategy because you didn't connect it. So in the long run, low-hanging fruit to me, and I will just claim personal with this, I don't want Kelly to get in trouble, is bogus. It is an excuse to not execute, all right? There are intervals and increments, which are short-term deliverables. Low-hanging fruit does not fit that category unless it is strategically aligned to the long-term vision. If you're just throwing something on a wall to look like you're busy, you're doing everyone a disservice. Let's go back to the other slide where people aren't being honest. You really have to think hard to get it connected to the strategy. This is an enterprise issue. It's a long-term consideration. You just have to find the right way to present it. There, I had a, there's someone else who said they hate that phrase, long hanging fruit, so they are obviously a genius like I am. Anyway, Kelly, I know this is something I am on the soapbox about. I don't see you have anything to add to this here in the next few minutes. No, 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 I, I, you can stay on your soapbox. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, let's go on. I think this is our, our last one, and then we're gonna go into the Q&A here. Keeping management engaged because everyone's afraid. Wow, bang, Gideon, got it again, The Shining. All right, who's the actor? Which is easy. You got to be, yeah, boom, boom. Maxine comes through again on that one, Jack Nicholson. Here's Johnny. Anyway, um, fear, ineffective sponsors. The sponsor, you get a sponsor, and they're really cool, and they're really hip, and they're really on board. And then some resistance hits, and you hit a rough patch, and your sponsor sends a direct report to your meeting because your sponsor is now afraid of bad consequences. And then you get uh, distractions and bad status reports and ineffective issue resolution. And at that point, your sponsor has gone over the way of the shining and has been possessed by the dark side. I should put a Darth Vader picture there too, because they've gone over to the dark side. All right, um, uh, anyway, remedy here. Hey, leadership, walk the talk. That's all you have to do, all right? Present evidence all the time that you're supporting this. That's how we know you're engaged. We actually do a formal sponsor evaluation. We have a little sponsorship engagement scorecard. We do, and I'm sure that there's other similar vehicles out there, but we actually will sit down with the sponsor and through an interview, we'll let, we can find out if they're really on board or not, and then recommend possibly uh, rotate another sponsor in there. Which, by the way, is our other remedy. A lot of people say, I can do this, but I can't do it forever. I don't want to do this forever. Rotate your council chairs, rotate your sponsors, rotate your champions, let people take turns doing this. That spreads the message. That spreads the, the wealth. Anything else on that one, uh, Kelly? 
Yeah, I think it's really important to consider the WIFM. So just because somebody is a senior executive or they're, they're a leader within the organization, there needs to be a clear what's in it for me. And so when identifying a sponsor, when working with a sponsor or anyone else within the leadership group, it's important to consider why they should care about information, why they should care about data, how it ties back to their specific line of business, how it ties back to their future role in the company. So if they are on a promotion track, there might be an opportunity to give them a differentiator and to help them with the next phase in their career. So the WISM for the leadership group is extraordinarily important to keep them engaged um, and to make sure that there is that level of personal contact uh, with those leaders. One of the things that, that um, uh, is common and that, that we do, and I'm sure a lot of you have already done, is to do some sort of uh, influence analysis around your leaders to understand who do they go to for advice? Who do they go to for help? And so making sure that you are engaged and working with those individuals that your sponsor or your leaders listen to for advice will help to have other people within your organization communicating similar messages to what you're trying to communicate and they're hearing from a messenger that they trust so that there's a higher likelihood that they will agree, absorb, and action the messaging based on the advice coming from that trusted uh, individual. Okay, and um, on our last one here, and then uh, Sh um, Shannon, I'm going to actually turn control back over to you. You can take control back. I'll talk to this one, and Kelly's going to moderate the Q&A because I have to um, uh, leave this spot where I'm sitting right now. And if we don't have a scary cartoon, we're ending up on kind of a nice note here. Um, people say this stuff isn't important. And Kelly, I'm going to let you run with this one, and I will be listening in, and I will do the color commentary on this as well as the Q&A. So I'll turn that one back over to you, Kelly. Sure, and so a couple of things, and I think that this is a nice way to kind of wrap everything up in the sense that there, the fear and the concern is that it's pie in the sky. Uh, we're not quite sure why we're doing it. We were told that we needed to do it at a conference. Uh, there's not a clear view of why this is important and also what the outcome will potentially be. Um, another uh, issue that comes up in terms of it not being important is that the expectation that the data is already within a state of being usable, understood, consumable, and so therefore trying to go through lots of additional effort uh, is too expensive and irrelevant. Just give me the data and I'll figure out what to, the, what to do with the data uh, myself. Um, thinking that Anything around information management is tied to IT is another big concern, and that is one of the things that reduces, in many people's view, the importance of information and data. So what are some of the things that we want to do about it? So the planning and the visioning com uh, components of this so that it isn't pie in the sky, that it is truly aligned to expectations, and it's a very clear message around what is the vision, what is the picture of the future that you're going to have, what is the purpose that you are, uh, that you have in executing this program, what is the plan in which you are going to deliver this program and who participates. So that sort of five-step process that we uh, talk about is a way of creating a communication to make it real and to tie the execution back to the purpose and the vision. And there is work associated with developing it, validating it, getting your leaders involved with doing uh, the work and communicating it as well. Um, another remedy, ensuring that this is identified as a budgeted and prioritized effort. Um, thinking that this is something that can be done as a skunk's work project is a short-term viewpoint because at some point there needs to be greater investment in the way that data and information is managed, governed, and shared 
Um, just like there's additional investment anytime there's a new view of the importance within the organization, there will be additional investment in the consumption of the data, whether it's through an analytics project, whether it is uh, looking at a big data infrastructure, et cetera. So therefore, the analogous investment needs to be made in the data and information that feeds into those efforts as well. And then I think the idea that talk about the funding uh, in the very beginning and start thinking about how that funding is tied back to the value and the strategy should indicate why the funding is actually a good investment, should articulate um, the uh, cost analysis as well as the benefit analysis. I'm, I'm very hesitant to say ROI just because uh, it's very hard to, to look at a true uh, return on investment, not the risk of incarceration, <laughs> but the return on investment um, from a short-term perspective. So those are some thoughts in terms of trying to elevate the importance of information management and of data within the organization. Uh, and of course, to make sure that it is viewed as an asset, just like any other asset within the company. And I think that that's the most important thing as we wrap up here is to think about the fact of communicating around how it is important and the fact that it is an asset just like any other. And with that, I think we're going to go to the Q&A because we've got about 10 minutes left. So. Perfect. Well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, John, for this fantastic presentation, um, for this very scary presentation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, just a reminder, next in the in the series is uh, Real World Data Strategy Success Stories. Uh, that is happening on uh, November 3rd. And just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides, links to the recording, and anything else requested throughout. Um, you know, Kelly, backing up to when you uh, guys were talking about communication and quality, um, mm -hmm. can you give examples of how you communicate in this scenario and any tricks for ensuring your communications are read? So a uh, couple of things on that. Um, one of the things that I always challenge people to think about is how to communicate outside of email because everybody is inundated with email. Um, people prioritize what they read and that because you can easily get deprioritized, that is a risk associated with using email as a communication vehicle. So when we think about all of the other communication uh, options, one thing would be to get your communications group, if you are, sorry, at a large company that has a marketing communications group, an internal marketing and communications group, leverage them as much as possible. So that's one thing to start embedding it into the communications within the company. The other thing is I would think about it as who you need to communicate with and targeting your communications to those audiences specifically and participating face-to-face -face as much as possible or in some sort of conversational manner. So that could be participating in uh, departmental meetings or quarterly meetings that those organizations have. It could be doing lunch and learns. Um, it could be doing a road show. It could be uh, um, bringing to your different field offices something that would be compelling to them to help communicate why information is important to those different field offices. Um, anything that can tie into communication vehicles that are already occurring or a communication approach that already occurs within the organization. Um, anything that you could do around video, anything that you could do in which your peers participate in video. Um, I know that uh, Jill, who we talked about earlier, did this fantastic video a few years ago. Um, that was focused on why data governance is important. And it, you know, essentially went viral within the organization because people wanted to see how their peers were participating in this video, whether it was for amusement purposes or whether it was um, to be impre impressed with the group. The idea is it was visual. It was involving their peers and people really um, wanted to see it. And by nature of wanting to see it, they heard the message. So I know that's a long answer, but communication is so important and it's really important to be creative around the communication process. 
Sure, no, that's great. And, you know, uh, and continuing on from that, what is a good way to tie in and analyze bottom line impact of poor data quality and DG efforts? So the easiest way to tie uh, poor data quality and therefore the requirement for data governance uh, is around productivity and usage of the data. So the way that people uh, go through the process of identifying what data they need accessing the data um, or getting access to the data, having the data shared with them, and then the way that they use the data, that sort of productivity impact and the assessment and analysis of that process is always the first place that we look for any sort of quantitative impact. So if it takes seven days to create a, a strategic report, how can you reduce the seven days to something like two based on making sure that the data is more available or more understood, uh, more fit for purpose, is of higher quality, potentially more complete, uh, et cetera. So that productivity and usage of the data is the first place that we look for anything that's quantitatively uh, tied to the improvement of data quality because it's the most direct way of tying it. Uh, another place to look that is along the same lines but um, slightly different is the amount of effort associated with the data piece in any sort of new big strategic project. So whether you are doing a deployment of a new uh, capability, whether you are uh, upgrading an application from a prior version to a more current version, there is a data piece of that that always occurs. So what is the cost associated with that data migration? What is the cost associated with uh, ensuring that the data is structured and mapped in an appropriate way for the new application that you are implementing? That data piece of a project uh, is uh, easy, well, not easy, but can be quantified and the ability to reduce the amount of time, effort, and therefore cost in the project as it pertains to that data piece is another place to find hard dollars. Now, the negative of that is that you're always looking in the rearview mirror, but if you're able to say, and you can demonstrate trending over time, where you have reduced that data component of project initiation, that is something where you can deliver clear value to the organization. All right, we just have just a couple minutes left, but I think we've got time for another question. Uh, yeah. And this is one that we hear quite often. Our current issue is associated with a group we roll up in, into our quote unquote ineffective sponsor. We mm -hmm. sit in IT, which has caused major issues with funding the build out of our IOG DG capability. Any thoughts on how to address this? So, the challenge of having an ineffective sponsor not getting the credit that you need uh, being exacerbated by sitting in IT. I think that the first thing that I would say is to look at how you can have an impact. What is that impact and how can you start to uh, quantify the impact? And if you can't quantify it, where can you find those stories and those anecdotes that will be relevant to the rest of the organization? And so that is one way of doing more or less a grassroots effort where you are uh, looking at how you can improve operational processes, uh, improve the consumption of data or the usage of data by improving data quality, um, data understanding, et cetera. So that would be one thing. The other thing I would look at is how does your corporate strategy impact the view of data? So I would go back to what your, uh, well, 2017 goals now, as we're looking into 2017, and what, what are the implications of not having good data to the execution of your corporate, object, corporate objectives? Now, going back to the slides, that might be too pie in the sky. So how can you get down to your divisional objectives, your departmental objectives, and tie data specifically to it? So for example, if you are trying to uh, uh, acquire a new customer base, maybe you are shifting from 
a business customer to a consumer customer? What is the data requirement to A, identify that new market, B, understand how to go after that new market, identify whether you already have customers within that market, et cetera, et cetera. So by tying the actual data and information management pieces uh, into the written, approved, and uh, you know distributed strategy is the kind of top-down way to go and then the bottom-up way to go in terms of those specific anecdotes, stories, and potentially quantitative benefits. So those would be the two tactics I would take. And of course, that's a big question. And so more than happy to take um, an email or a phone call and talk about yeah. that further. And uh, just a well, third, we are right third. at the top of the hour. Oh. John, you're no breaking problem. up. Think, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, just a third one is tell that person that no matter how hard they work, they're not going to succeed. That might open their mind to another sponsor. Sure. Um, and again, we are right at the top of the hour. Just want to uh, thanks John and Kelly for another, again, pr fantastic presentation. And thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I'll get the remaining questions over to John and Kelly for you. Um, and just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Boo. Boo.